Well, this is most certainly a day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to worship with us here at Calvary. I'm Pastor Ben, and it is good to be with each and every one of you today. A special welcome if you are new or visiting with us today, or if you are joining us online, it is good to have you here. Everything you need for today's service can be found up on the screen over my shoulder. The only other place you may want to reach this morning is for that red hymnal in the pew in front of you. So please join us in singing and responding in worship this morning. Out in the narthex, there is this uh, one-page sheet that has all of our announcements that are happening in and around our community, as well as a prayer list on the back. I wanted to highlight just a couple announcements this morning for us. Uh, first, our annual meeting will be this morning uh, following this worship service at 9.15, so we'll have a bit of a break for you to uh, use the restrooms, get a cup of coffee, whatever you may need, but please, please, please come back for our annual meeting. We have a couple uh, really important votes happening, and uh, it's good to be together doing the work of the church. Looking ahead towards Lent, we will be having a, a Lenten book study during Lent on Dietrich Bonhoeffer's Life Together. It's a little book, five chapters long, and we will be studying it together as a congregation. There are two opportunities uh, to join in a book discussion about uh, that book, uh, happening Sundays between the services um, and Tuesdays at 12.15. You'll find more information about that there. Uh, we expect the books to be uh, here in the office this week, so please uh, stop by and pick up a book. There will be $10 uh, for the congregation, so please join us for that. With that, I'll invite you to stand as you are able as we begin worship with our confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, creator of darkness and life, light, word of truth, wind sweeping over the waters. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. God, our rock and refuge, we pour out our hearts before you. We have wounded one another and sinned against you. We have not always recognized the Holy Spirit dwelling in each of us. Remember your covenant. Renew your creation. Restore us that we might proclaim your good news to all. Amen. The voice of the Lord is upon the waters. God has spoken. The time of grace is now. In Jesus, the reign of God has come near by the authority of Jesus Christ. Your sins are forgiven. You are God's beloved. Amen. Let us sing.
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us sing our Kyrie. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. Amen. We sing. This is the feast of victory for our God. Alleluia, 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 alleluia. Worthy is Christ, the Lamb who was slain, whose blood set us free to be people of God. Power and riches, wisdom and strength, and honor and blessing and glory are His. This is the feast of victory for our God. Alleluia, 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 alleluia. Sing with all the people of God and join in the hymns of all creation. Blessing and honor, glory and might be to God and the Lamb forever. Amen. This is the feast of victory for our God. Alleluia, 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 alleluia. For the Lamb who was slain has begun his reign. Alleluia. This is the feast a victory for our God. Alleluia, 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 alleluia. Let us pray. Compassionate God, you gather the whole universe into your radiant presence and continually reveal your Son as our Savior. Bring wholeness to all that is broken and speak truth to us in our confusion that all creation will see and know your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. You may be seated as we turn to the Word. The first reading is from Deuteronomy, the 18th chapter. Moses said, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people. You shall heed such a prophet. This is what you requested of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly when you said, if I hear the voice of the Lord my God anymore or ever see this great fire, I will die. Then the Lord replied to me, they are right in what they have said. I will raise up for you a prophet like you from among their own people. I will put my words in the mouth of the prophet who shall speak to them everything that I command. 
Anyone who does not heed the words that the prophet shall speak in my name, I myself will hold accountable. But for any prophet who speaks in the name of other gods, or who presume to speak in my name a word that I have not commanded the prophet to speak, that prophet shall die. This is the word of the Lord. We will read responsively Psalm 111. Hallelujah, I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart in the assembly of the upright in the congregation. Great are your works, O Lord, pondered by all who delight in them. Majesty and splendor mark your deeds and your righteousness endures forever. You cause your wonders to be remembered. You are gracious and full of compassion. You give food to those who fear you, remembering forever your covenant. You have shown your people the power of your works in giving them the lands of the nations. The works of your hands are faithfulness and justice. All of your precepts are sure. They stand fast forever and ever because they are done in both truth and equity. You sent redemption to your people and commanded your covenant forever. Holy and awesome is your name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All who practice this have a good understanding. God's praise endures forever. The second reading is from 1 Corinthians, the 8th chapter. Now concerning food sacrifices to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Anyone who claims to know something does not yet have the necessary knowledge, but anyone who loves God is known by him. Hence, as to eating of foods offered to idols, we know that no idol in the world really exists, and that there is no God but one. Indeed, even though there are many there may be many so-called gods in heaven or on earth, 
as in fact there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom all are all things and through whom we exist. It is not everyone, whoever, however, who has this knowledge, since some have become so accustomed to idols until now, they still think of the food they eat as food offered to an idol, and their conscience, being weak, is defiled. Food will not bring us close to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat, and no better off if we do. But take care that this liberty of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if others see you, who possess knowledge, eating in the temple of an idol, might they not, since their conscience is weak, be encouraged to the point of eating food sacrificed to idols? So by your knowledge, those weak believers for whom Christ died are destroyed. But when you thus sin against members of your family and wound their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food is a cause of their failing, I will never eat meat so that I may not cause one of whom to, of them to fall. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand for the hearing of the gospel. Alleluia, 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 alleluia. The Holy Gospel according to Mark in the first chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus and his disciples went to Capernaum. And when the Sabbath came, he entered the synagogue and taught. They were astounded at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Just then there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying with a loud voice, came out of him. They were all amazed, and they kept on asking one another, What is this, a new teaching with authority? He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. At once his fame began to spread throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. Well, grace and peace to you from Jesus who has everything to do with us. Amen. If you were to go to the movies to see this gospel story up on the silver screen, how would you imagine this unclean spirit would be portrayed, represented on that screen? For some of us, a typical representation of unclean spirits or of demons may be conjured. You know, the snarling, savage beasts with toothy maws that are drooling and slobbering. For others of you, you may uh, conjure this other typical image of uh, spirits in particular, those spooky, ethereal ghouls that have supernatural powers. But for some of you, it may be something else altogether. After all, evil is presented in many different ways in cinema. There's the stereotypical evil, you know, the kind in movies about heroes and villains like Marvel or James Bond, where the bad guy is so obviously the bad one. You know, they're typically unlikable and power-hungry. They may have a tall coat and a menacing stance and a weapon of mass destruction. You may conjure up a, a more cartoonish evil, not necessarily an animated evil, but the, the cartoonish evil in movies that set up uh, these cosmic forces between good and evil, you know, movies like Harry Potter or Star Wars, where the evil ones are brutish and their only character trait in the entire film is being evil. 
They probably have a scar or some other inhumane characteristic that makes them unlike us. These sorts of evil characters have one thing in common for me. They're all fake. They only exist in fiction. Real evil that we experience day to day looks very different. So how we imagine the unclean spirit in this story matters because while many of us don't necessarily believe that spirits and demons are running around rampantly possessing us anymore, this story about Jesus casting out one such demon still has something to claim about our world that we live in. In other words, just because ordinary life is lived without spirits and demons, that does not mean that evil is not real. Think about it. The most compelling representations of evil in the stories we tell are the ones that could be us. Actors have commented that when they are trying to play an unpalatable character, they first try to find what is ordinary in the character. They then try to find what is lovable in the character. So it is striking to me, thinking about this gospel story, that it takes place on a holy day in a holy place of worship. It is as if the man with an unclean spirit were sitting here among us in our ordinary and lovable community. The unclean spirit in this story is no caricature of evil. No, it is the very real brokenness and evil that we experience in our very real lives. So what is this spirit then? Well, some biblical scholars point out that it could be related to mental illness or some other medical condition like epilepsy, while other scholars insist that the spirits are metaphors for anything that might possess or control us anger, fear, lust, greed, hatred, envy, addiction, you name it. Anything that controls us or possesses us. Now, I don't know which of these explanations is necessarily true for this story or if it really matters at the end of the day. Because what is most disturbing about this spirit that shows up in the synagogue isn't who or what it is, but what it does to the poor man who is possessed. The man had no voice. The spirit spoke for him. The man had no control over his body. The spirit convulsed him. The man had no dignity. The spirit dehumanized him. The truth is we all suffer or have suffered under these sorts of spirits that diminish, distort, and wound us. All of us know or have known what it's like to lose agency, mobility, and dignity to forces too powerful for us to defeat on our own. Either we have experienced it ourselves, or we have seen it happen to those we love. And these spirits, whether we regard them as spiritual, psychological, biological, metaphorical, or cultural, They rob us all of life, love, community, and safety. Yet there is a more powerful truth in this story, that we are not alone. In Christ, God enters the sacred, ordinary realities of our lives, stepping directly into the pain, into the rage and the ugliness, Jesus steps into the horror that these spirits leave with us. Jesus attracted wonder and astonishment from those he taught because his brand of holiness didn't require him to keep his hands clean. In other words, it didn't require him to keep us at a distance. He was in the fear He was in the sickness, he was in the nightmare, ready to engage anything that diminished the lives of those he loved. He heard the cries of the unclean spirit bellowing from the man, and he saw that the spirit, he saw through that spirit, and saw the human being wrapped in its clutches. And he rebuked it for the sake of the broken man's health and sanity. 
Yes, Jesus looked past the evil, past the illness, past the disease, and saw a human being in need. And Jesus took action, silencing it, taking away its power, and casting it out. It is not a mistake that the unclean spirit recognized Jesus before anyone else does in our story. I believe our demons, our fears, our addictions, our sins, our prejudices, our biases, our compulsions, whatever it is that possesses and seeks to control our life, I believe those things have a tendency to recognize Jesus first before we do because they know that an encounter with him will change everything. So they recoil. They put up a loud voice, vicious, in their fight before they finally surrender. Sometimes our lives get harder when we move toward faith and healing because the unclean spirits always fight hardest when their time is up. And dear ones, their time is up. Jesus has come bringing the good news of God. The kingdom of God has come near. So we can truly answer the question the unclean spirit asks. What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? The only answer that has ever possibly been true is everything. Jesus has everything to do with us. Wherever there is pain, God is there too. Wherever there is darkness, God is there too. Wherever there is torment, God is there too. God has everything to do with us, even and especially when we are at our worst. When the pain of the world surrounds us, when we are overwhelmed by guilt or despair, when hope is but a fickle thought, Jesus shows up in some way. In the friends we have close to us, in our families, in strangers on the street, Jesus shows up in some way with authority that changes everything. Amen. There is a balm in Gilead to make the wounded whole. There is a balm in Gilead to heal the sin-sick soul. Sometimes I feel discouraged and think my work's in vain. But then the Holy Spirit revives my soul again. And there is a balm in Gilead to make the wounded whole. There is a balm in Gilead to make the sin sick soul. If you cannot preach like Peter, if you cannot pray like Paul, you can tell the love of Jesus and say he died for all. There is a balm in Gilead to make the wounded whole. There is a balm in Gilead to heal the sin-sick soul. Don't ever be discouraged, for Jesus is your friend. And if you lack for knowledge, he'll ne'er refuse to lend. There is a balm 
in Gilead to make the wounded whole. There is a balm in Gilead to heal the sin-sick soul. With the whole people of God around the world, let us confess our faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty. I believe in Jesus Christ, As we celebrate Christ embodied in human form, we pray for God's blessing on the church, the world, and all of creation. Loving God, we pray that your example of teaching with confidence and authority builds up your church in love. May all church leaders and teachers honor your instruction and model your inclusive ways. God of grace, receive our prayer. Renewing God, we pray for all of creation that waterways flow clean and clear, natural spaces are protected, and our planet is healed. Let us commit our thoughtful care of the earth. God of grace, justice seeking God, we pray for those in government and community leadership that they lead with honor and mindfulness. May they remember their covenants and be upright in their ways. God of grace, receive our prayer. Compassionate God, we pray for all in need, especially those who have known rejection, any who struggle with long-term illness or chronic pain, those without access to safe housing or health care and any who suffer. God of grace, receive our prayer. Still speaking, God, we pray for our congregation, for its artists and musicians, for its educators and caregivers, that all gifts are used to care for those in need and to live out your example of accompaniment, gospel witness, and love. God of grace, receive our prayer. Eternal God, we remember all who have been teachers, mentors, and companions in the church and in our lives. We trust that all who have died rest in your loving care. God of grace, receive our prayer. Knowing the Holy Spirit intercedes for us, we offer these prayers and the silent prayers of our hearts in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Dear ones, the peace of the Lord be with you always. Let us share a sign of Christ's peace with one another.
Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you all so much for the gifts that you give to this place. Without you and your generosity, we could not do the mission and ministry that we all have been called to. So thank you. I invite you now to stand as you are comfortable as we receive these offerings in prayer. Let us pray. Blessed are you, Holy One, for all good things come from you. In bread and cup you open heaven to us. Meet us at this table that we receive what we seek and follow your Son, Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It, it is, is right to give, give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right our duty and our joy that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ. By the leading of a star, he has shown forth to all nations. In the waters of the Jordan, you proclaimed him your beloved Son. And in the miracle of water turned to wine, he revealed your glory. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the host of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. He gave thanks and he broke it. He gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup. He gave thanks and he gave it to all to drink, saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. And gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thy is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated to receive a couple instructions for communion as our communion uh, volunteers come forward. You'll be invited forward by one of the ushers, and you will receive a wafer in your hand, which you may eat. You will then receive a little cup, which you may drink. There are gluten-free and alcohol-free options available for all are welcome at this table. If you have any mobility concerns whatsoever, just let the ushers know. They will let us know, and we will come to you. This table is set for all, and at Jesus' table, heaven and earth are joined as one, so come and see. Come. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. 
Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Grant us peace. Grant us peace.
Dear ones, I invite you to stand as you are comfortable. May the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Let us pray. Giver of every gift, Christ's body is our food, and we are Christ's body. Raise us to life by your power for the benefit of all and to your glory now and forever. Amen. Dear ones, as we leave this place, we take with us the lessons we have learned, the community we have built, and this blessing from God. God who names you, Christ who claims you, and the Holy Spirit who dwells in you, bless you and remain with you always. Amen. Let us sing. Go in peace, but stay for the annual meeting. You are God's beloved. Thanks be to God.